All right, well, this is the voice of Manolis Gellis, but the text of Eric Alm. And uh, he's sending a message that I will then record with some photos. So Eric writes, Dear Manolis, best wishes on your 42nd birthday. What a great idea to celebrate 42 with a symposium on the meaning of life. I'm sad to miss the day, but by the time of the symposium, I'll be deep in the Malaysian jungle, doing field work with a population of hunter-gatherers. I'll elaborate more on that later. I don't know much about the meaning of life, but I can share some thoughts on the nature of life that resonated with me on today's drive from Kuala Lumpur. But first, to understand what I'm talking about, you need to take a close look at the mountains pictured below. What's striking about these limestone cliffs in Malaysia is the shape. I've never seen such vertical edges, except in a valley where it's obvious how they form, carved from the water of some ancient river. So what causes a shape like that on a mountain that's not near any bodies of water? Oh, that's because it's made of limestone, our local guide said. I don't understand. There's a lot of rain, not now, but during the rainy season. Oh, I see. The rain washes away the limestone, making a vertical face. But then why is it flat on top and not rounded? Well, that's because the forest on top keeps the rain from eroding the rock, she said, in a way that made me feel conspic conspicuously like a computational biologist. I love that. These examples remind us how closely life is linked to and inseparable from our environment, even things like rocks that we generally think of as non-living. This exchange reminded me of a conversation I once had with Raphael Brass, the former head of civil and environmental engineering department. Raphael is a hydrologist and studies how forests affect landscapes and even weather patterns. In one study, Raphael looked at a set of fields of hills with northern and southern facing slopes. The surprising aspect of those hills was that the two faces were completely different environments. Different exposure to the sun led to different species of plants in each face. The different plants had different root structures and therefore different hydrology. And different hydrology made sand of different sizes and shapes. And together, these factors led to different slopes for the northern and southern faces. According to Raphael, all the landscapes that we see, with only a few exceptions, like badlands, are linked to life in an unexpected way. Not all this was surprising enough, but the real epiphany for me was in the logical progression from these basic facts. Root structure determines hydrology, and hydrology determines the terrain. But doesn't there also have to be a gene that determines root structure? If so, then there's a gene that determines the shape of a hill. In fact, everything from the slope of the northern face to the texture of the sand is coded in DNA. So maybe it's better to think of the hill as part of the plant itself. But it's not that simple. Even the northern face has many different types of plants, each of which contributes to the shape of the hills. It's hard to tell where to draw the boundary between living organisms. It's even hard to tell where to draw the boundary between living and non-living things. The point brings me back to why I'm in the jungle in the first place. We now know that human beings aren't just a single organism. We're an ecosystem teeming with bacteria that perform all sorts of functions for us. The human microbiome, and just like it's hard to tell where to draw the line between the plants and the hills, it's hard to draw the line between ourselves and our microbial inhabitants. So we're in the jungle trying to preserve the microbes that keep indigenous populations in this area connect with their environment. And we're taking samples back to MIT so that we can preserve these organisms for future generations. We're doing it because these bacteria are an important part of what makes us human. And it's hard to draw the line between them and us, their human hosts. All of this, which is to say, is a nice way that we're in the jungle collecting poop. So I'll leave you with one final observation on your birthday. If there's one thing that connects every human population around us, 
no matter how remote and isolated, is that everyone smiles at poop jokes. And so, armed with that important piece of knowledge and an extra large jug of liquid nitrogen, we set off in a few hours to make some new friends smile. Happy birthday, Eric. Thank you, Eric.